Coming up this evening, live from New York City, a stronger than expected jobs report for July. Businesses continue to hire, but what about recession fears? Senate Democrats secure a much needed vote to pass a huge tax and spending bill. What's the potential impact to investors if it's passed? Facebook parent company Meta releases its first bond offering. Is it a good investment? That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Chenny Wu here for NTD Business. The latest jobs numbers are out. The U.S. economy added 528,000 jobs in July, way more than economists expected. The Labor Department says total employment is now back to pre-pandemic levels. The job growth was across the board. The leisure and hospitality sector added the most, nearly 100,000 jobs. The unemployment rate fell to 3.5 percent after sitting at 3.6 percent for four months. Wages also grew faster than economists expected. Average hourly earnings rose 0.5 percent from June. The Federal Reserve is watching wage increases very closely right now because there are concerns that companies will pass on the labor costs to consumers, further fueling inflation. The strong jobs report could force the Fed to be more aggressive in hiking interest rates. Their next meeting is in September, when they could raise rates by three-quarters of a percentage point instead of half. And here to talk to Entity's Don Ma about the jobs report is Paul McDonald. He's the senior executive director at human resource consulting firm Robert Half. Paul, thank you for joining us today. So 528,000 jobs added this month. I I was very surprised, quite surprised when I saw it this morning, very easily surpassing expectations. What's the takeaway here, Paul? Well, the takeaway is that the job market for the past eight months, uh, actually since the um, rebound from the pandemic, has been very, very good. Um, 528, as you mentioned, 528,000 jobs created and a revision for the previous two months actually showed the strength in the job market today. And unemployment at 3.5 percent, that ticked down a little bit. And a real um, interesting fact, too, is college degreed workers, the unemployment rate is at 2 percent which is uh, not usually reported, but we follow that closely. Some say we're technically in a recession, right? Two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. So how does this month's very surprising and high jobs numbers fit into that discussion? I've been in business for a while. I've been through a few recessions. Um, I can only speak to the labor market today. It really is a, a good market to be a job seeker It's hard for employers to find individuals today. The recession talk, I'm not an economist, but I can say that I've never seen a recession that hasn't had, um, that has had labor so um, hard to find with unemployment so low. For every two openings, there's only one person that's available today that's unemployed. Those companies that are doing everything they can to um, offer competitive salaries, um, to make sure that they're offering good benefits, to offer good career advancement and to help upskill um, their employee, not only the incoming employee, but let's talk about retention strategies. As long as you can get the person on board, or if you have the person on board, you have to focus on retention as well as acquisition. What would your advice be for businesses to better retain their workforce? Well, If you're looking to retain individuals, first of all, look at what each individual as an individual, Uh, manage them, communicate with them, lead them, review all your um, pushes and pulls in terms of what it is to lead employees and to manage employees. Heavy communication, especially if they're remote or in a hybrid situation, make sure that you're communicating with them regularly and you're looking at their career advancement opportunities. If you can't offer salaries, then look at what you can do to help upskill that individual, teach them new things, because that's what they're after uh, in in addition to salary bumps. Some companies are offering stay bonuses to individuals in order to retain them. Um, And in addition to those other strategies, they're looking at culture. How can we make sure that it's a culture that is sticky, that is going to uh, help retain individuals, but also attract individuals? I see. 
So just one last question, Paul. For your report, you talked to more than 1,500 managers, right? Which sector in the labor market is it the easiest to find a job right now? Oh, well, at all levels in which we cover, in accounting and finance, technology, um, healthcare on the back office, uh, creative and marketing, legal, and um, higher-end administrative staffing, all those um, areas are good. I would point out there's coding, there's help desk um, individuals that are in high demand, financial analysts and senior accountants, um, marketing managers, corporate communications individuals, and attorneys are in high demand. All right. Thank you very much for your insight. Paul McDonald, Senior Executive Director at Robert Half. Pleasure talking to you today. Pleasure to chat with you. Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona was the lone Democrat holdout. But now, after some negotiations, she's announced that she will back the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. It'll likely pass the Senate. And today's Colin Fredrickson has more. Kirsten Sinema, the lone Democrat holdout, has voiced support for the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Now, with the 50 votes needed, the bill will very likely pass in the Senate. Sinema negotiated some changes to the bill, an elimination of the tax increase on carried interest income, a tax on share buybacks, a change to parts of the 15% minimum tax to make it less burdensome on manufacturers, and drought money for Arizona. Carried interest is the money an investment firm keeps from its investors as payment for making those investments. When you are taxing uh, investments, whether that investment reward is going to the invest the core investor or going to the person that is helping them make those investments, you're creating a t- an overall tax on investments. Patrick Hedger is the executive director of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, a nonprofit that advocates for lower taxes and limited government. Hedger says raising this tax is essentially raising the price of accessing investor services. He thinks it's good the tax increases may be dropped. The carried interest tax increase may be replaced with a 1% tax on share buybacks. Share buybacks are when a company buys back some of its shares, which enriches shareholders. Taxing share buybacks is, again, just trying to penalize investment. Hedger says the economy needs more investment, and relying on this as a revenue source isn't good for the economy. If the Senate does pass the bill, it'll then head to the House. Almost every Democrat in the House will need to vote for the bill without any changes. House Republicans appear to be unified against it. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. China is now sanctioning House Speaker Nancy Pelosi because of her trip to Taiwan. She's the most senior U.S. official to be sanctioned by Beijing. It's not clear what these sanctions are exactly. But in the past, China's sanctions usually involved not letting people enter the country or do business there. China is also instituting multiple other measures toward the U.S., This includes no more cooperation on anti-drug measures, tackling transnational crime, or on climate issues. Wall Street ended mixed today. The Dow added 77 points, or two-tenths of a percent. The S&P lost seven points, or less than two-tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq gave up 63 points, or half a percent. A company best known for sending stuff to clutter up your house is now going to help customers clean up. Amazon is buying iRobot, the creator of the Roomba vacuum. The companies announced the deal today. The all-cash deal is worth around $1.7 billion, though it still needs to be approved by shareholders and regulators. Shares of iRobot soared nearly 20% today. This isn't Amazon's first move regarding robotics. In 2021, it debuted Astro a 20-pound household robot for home monitoring that learns its owner's habits. The beer industry is facing a carbon dioxide shortage, and the situation is serious because CO2 is a key ingredient in beer production. And here to talk to Indies Danma about the situation is Chuck Skypeck. He's the Technical Brewing Projects Director at the Brewers Association. So Chuck, great to have you on today. So here's something new. There's a shortage of carbon dioxide. Now, normally this wouldn't have caught my attention, but apparently it's affecting beer production. Now it's serious. So Chuck, I just have to know, on behalf of all beer drinkers everywhere, is there going to be a beer shortage? 
You know, the situation is actually pretty dire for a lot of breweries. Um, I think it's important to, to realize that carbon dioxide, CO2, is an ingredient in beer. It is, it is in the beer that the consumer actually ingests, and it is flavor active. It, has, uh, it lowers the pH of beer that accents certain flavors, and it actually contributes some flavors to beer. So not only is it in beer, though, it's also critical to the production of beer. So without CO2, brewers can't brew beer. So exposure to oxygen at any time in a beer's lifetime is, is, is detrimental to the beer's flavor. So in, as the beer moves through the process, instead of being blanketed by air with, that contains a lot of oxygen, that the beer during process is typically blanketed by an inert gas, carbon dioxide. And then, of course, that carbon dioxide is worked into the beer as carbonation as well. So during the process and in the final product. Actually, there's been on and off shortages of carbon dioxide since the beginning of the pandemic in the spring of 2020. So about 40% of the carb of the CO2 in the US comes from the product as a byproduct of production of ethanol and when the pandemic started the and the demand for ethanol dropped and ethanol essentially was stopped being produced so no more CO2 so there was an, another period of pretty intense shortage right at the start of the pandemic but the supply has never recovered from that Another source of CO2 is as a byproduct of the production of fertilizer. And this is the time of year that a lot of fertilizer facilities shut down for, uh, for maintenance. So all these factors have come together right now to produce a shortage that we're seeing all across the U.S. How are companies being impacted right now? How are they coping? Well, that, that's, the, you know, if you're talking about missing an essential ingredient, uh, if you don't have that ingredient, you can't make the finished product, beer. So we're seeing companies that are, that are uh, curtailing their production schedules. Uh, that is, is, maybe they're producing beer four days instead of five. Uh, we're also seeing companies that have not received shipments, so they have to cease production until they get a new delivery of CO2. And we are seeing some companies that, uh, you know, if you if you think about it, our members, our, our brewery members have had uh, two and a half years of, of shutdowns where they were not able to sell beer at the start of the pandemic. We've seen inflationary pressures. We've seen other supply chain issues besides CO2. And it's been one thing after another for a lot of our members. So we have seen actually a couple close their doors for good. I see. Wow, the, the situation was more serious than I thought. But but I want to end uh, this afternoon's interview with on a light note. So last question, Chuck, what's your favorite beer? Oh, uh, not a fair question. Um, it it really depends on the season. It really depends upon what I'm eating. It really depends upon my mood. And uh, I guess I guess I'll just say there's a time and a place for every beer. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Chuck Skypeck, director at the Brewers Association. Appreciate you coming today. All right. Thank you very much. The battle between Twitter and Elon Musk is heating up. The social media platform just subpoenaed two of the billionaire's companies, Tesla and SpaceX, along with a number of his associates, including several prominent investment firms and venture capitalists. It's all part of Twitter's legal fight with Musk as he tries to back out of his proposed $44 billion deal to buy the company. Musk claims Twitter breached the agreement when it didn't hand over data about fake accounts. So Twitter is suing to force him to follow through with the deal. One of the people who got a subpoena called the whole thing a giant harassing fishing expedition. Twitter hasn't responded, but pushing Musk's associates to talk may just be a way to get the full story on why he wanted to walk away from the purchase. Was he really misled, or was this a strategy? The trial is set to start in October. Although Meta posted its first ever drop in revenue in the second quarter, there was reportedly $30 billion in demand for its $10 billion bond debut. And today's Sean Marshall has more. 
Facebook parent Meta Platforms Incorporated has raised $10 billion in its first ever bond offering on Thursday. Meta is looking to fund stock market share buybacks and investments to revamp its business, according to two sources close to the deal. The company received an A1 rating from Moody's and an AA rating Stable Outlook from S&P. Among big technology companies, Meta had been the only one that did not have debt on its books. I asked Santosh Rao, the head of research at Manhattan Ventures, whether MetaBond was a good investment to jump on. So I would wait. I mean, I would say the downside is limited, but so is the upside at this point. We need to see how the ad market uh, is operating. Right now, it's at a slowdown. You see all the companies exposed to ads are suffering, uh, are, are, are getting hit. And that's what happened here. Other tech giants such as Apple and Intel also issued bonds earlier this week, raising $5.5 billion and $6 billion. Here's how bond deal can help Meta. It, it's going to improve the uh, liquidity position of the company. Uh, it has a lot of cash already, but they are spending a lot of money on Metaverse. Uh, so they could use this extra money and they have the cap structure that allows them to take on debt. The company has been depleting its free cash flow as it charges ahead with its plans for the metaverse, a transformational bet that led the company to change its name to Meta last year. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Barclays, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Morgan Stanley were the joint book runners on the Meta Bond offering. Sean Marshall, NTD News. HBO Max and Discovery Plus subscribers can expect some major changes before next summer. As part of the massive merger involving Warner Media and Discovery, the two popular streaming services will be combining forces. The new service will blend HBO's scripted entertainment with Discovery's reality-based unscripted programming. In Warner Brothers Discovery's second quarter results, the company reports more than 92 million subscribers on the combined platforms. But the company also reported a substantial loss of $3.4 billion. Its stock fell roughly 17% today. Ever get annoyed because there are only a few internet providers you can choose from? Well, 5G internet is now apparently on the rise, trying to replace the traditional broadband internet we've all been using for years. Will it succeed? NTD's Phil Zhou has what you need. It's a battle between the old and the new, your trusty wired broadband internet versus the new wireless 5G internet. It's essentially a glorified hotspot. So who's winning? I didn't have to pay for the modem. There wasn't a sign up fee. I thought, you know, if it's cheaper and faster, that's a win. The two biggest U.S. cable companies, Charter, a.k.a. Spectrum, and Comcast, reported losing over 50,000 broadband internet customers in the second quarter. Compared to fixed wireless 5G providers like T-Mobile, it added over half a million customers during that same period. T-Mobile says more than half of its new customers switch over from broadband internet. I think it's been fascinating to see uh, T-Mobile in particular tap into these frustration customers. Jameson Zimmer is an authority in the internet provider space, working as the managing director at Fair Internet Report. There's a big pent-up demographic of frustrated customers who are now able to jump onto something new. And even though the service from T-Mobile has some issues around video quality and bandwidth constraints. People are just really enthusiastic about having a new option on the street, essentially. But Zimmer says he doesn't expect the 5G wireless success to last because if too many people start using the service, issues might come up. It just wouldn't work. Like the pages wouldn't open. They were really slow. Nina Clear works from home as a marketing professional. She counts on reliable internet to make a living. That's why she pays $80 a month for broadband cable internet. But back in February, because T-Mobile offered a cheaper option at only $50 a month, she decided to give fixed wireless 5G internet a try. I gave it a couple days and it just wouldn't work. I just couldn't get it to work, so I took it back. And I did see a signal. The signal was like four or five bars. It wasn't like I didn't see a signal, but it just wouldn't work for me. Zimmer says the true competition to traditional broadband internet is not wireless 5G, but fiber. The 5G, fixed 5G home internet service is a really compelling product for a customer whose only option is cable. But if they have fiber as an option, which is a more reliable service with about twice the speed capability, um, 
it's it's a, a bit less of a contest. Shares for broadband internet providers like Comcast and Charter are trading at near two-year lows, down 25% and 33% year-to-date, respectively. Phil Zhou, NTD News. Still to come, credit giant Equifax has been sued over its credit score mistakes. What's the lawsuit say? A super yacht, concept inspired by a famous diamond. How luxurious can it be? That and more are coming up on NTD Business. Welcome back. Yesterday, we told you about how Equifax sent wrong credit scores for millions of consumers. Well, the story isn't over yet. Now, a Florida woman has sued the company, claiming she was denied a car loan because of a 130-point mistake in her credit report. The class action lawsuit was filed in a federal court in Atlanta on behalf of Nydia Jenkins. The lawsuit claims she was forced to pay $150 more per month because of the mistake. Equifax's error potentially affected millions of others who applied for credit earlier this year. But the company says only a small number of customers would have received a different credit decision. If diamonds are a girl's best friend, this thing is the ultimate BFF. A diamond-inspired super yacht concept called the Stella del Sud, inspired by Cartier's famous 128-carat diamond. The design team behind it imagines an onboard cinema, helipad, and three pools, one with a waterfall effect. The main deck has room for eight VIP cabins, a gym, and a piano lounge. The owner's suite on the bridge deck has all the opulence you can think of, and even something you probably wouldn't think of, an aquarium in the ceiling over the bed. But right now, this is just a design, and the team that came up with it has been pretty tight-lipped about any further development. So who knows if this jewel will get its chance to shine on the open sea. And now over to Italy, an ancient Roman site where a wealthy merchant and his family once lived has reopened after 30 years. The site is decorated with spectacular frescoes of Roman and Egyptian gods. Let's take a look. The Baths of Caracalla is a big draw for tourists visiting Rome, and now there's something new to see. Authorities have recently opened up what was once a private home built here even before the public baths. The two-story house, or Domus, dates from around 134 to 138 AD during the reign of Emperor Hadrian. The Domus is reopening after 30 years and it is a great novelty because in addition to the prayer room that was already visible for those who were lucky enough to see it 30 years ago, we present a new room of the Domus that is the Triclinium with paintings that have never been seen before and therefore presented to the public for the first time. It's believed the wealthy merchant and his family lived here. It was partially destroyed to make way for the construction of the Caracalla public baths, which opened in the year 216 AD. There was the Domus of Asinius Polonius, who was an important politician who lived in the time of Augustus, before the owner of our Domus. There were also the private houses of some emperors, the Privata Adriani, namely the private house of Emperor Hadrian, that we know was right in the area of the small Aventine. So let's say the Domus belonged to wealthy people. The inner temple features images of Roman gods on one wall and silhouettes of Egyptian gods on the other walls. The blending of different belief systems was rare in domestic buildings of the period. On this wall, we can still see traces of a central god in whom Serapis could perhaps be recognized, but unfortunately she is almost completely faded. On the left, however, we can still clearly see the figure of Isis holding a torch. She was probably clutching ears of corn in her right hand, and she has feathers on her head and a lunar knot. There are plans to investigate the ruins more closely and hopefully shed more light on the lives of the people who called it home. Archaeologists may even restore parts of the building that were destroyed. 
And that's the latest from the NTD business team and myself, Chenny Wu. You can follow me on Twitter. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, send us an email at business at ntd.com. That's all for today. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.